Okay, now Bob knows which one it is. Major Bible themes. Chapter 5. Chapter 5. Chapter 5 is God the Trinity. Last time we were in this book, we looked at our diagram on the Trinity, and we discussed that, and that gave us a pictorial idea of how the Trinity actually works. That all three persons are perfectly unified, and all three persons are individually God. And so, uh, and one is not deity because the other one is. And we looked at that together, and that, that uh, very rough artistic disability of mine tries to prove that. Okay. <laughs> Now we're on to question number four and yes. chapter five. So the questions are on page 44, major Bible themes, chapter five. Page 44, question four. Define four systems of thought which attempt to explain the universe on the basis of a higher being. Okay, basis of a higher being on page 83 83 that's dyslexia on page 38 <laughs> sorry on page 38 uh, the third paragraph down the last paragraph on the page of page 38 of chapter 5 which begins on page 37 of major bible themes it says, in arguing for the existence of God from the facts of creation apart from the revelation of the scripture, there are four general classes or lines of reason that may be observed. Ontological argument. <coughs> Excuse me. Ontological argument holds that God must exist because man universally believes that he exists. This is sometimes called a priori et argument. All right, so um, remember this is based on understanding God outside the scriptures, that there must be a supreme being. Okay, ontological argument. Two cosmological argument this argument holds that every effect must have its sufficient cause so cause and effect cause and effect it's basically a philosophical and scientific premise basically therefore the universe which is an, an effect must have a creator as its cause Right, so that is called the cosmological. Cosmo meaning world. Um, and so um, we're leaving it there. Involved in this argument is the complexity of an ordered universe which could not have come into existence by accident. Okay. Number three. At the bottom of page 38. At the bottom of page 38, <coughs> number three, teleological argument points out that every design must have its designer. And as the whole creation is intricately designed and interrelated, creation must have a great designer. Okay, then you can read on about that. Fourth, on page 39. Page 39. The anthropological argument. Anthropological argues. From the nature and existence of man as being unexplained apart from the creation by God, who has a nature similar but greater than man's. So involved in that fact is intelligence, capacity to think, sensibility, capacity to feel, feel. Uh, will capacity to make moral choices such extraordinary ability points to one 
who has similar but greater abilities, who has created man. Okay, so let's go over those again, uh, just so that we have, have, the, have the idea. One is ontological argument, and that is the idea that because man universally believes there's a, a God, or now as they're calling it, higher power or supreme being, um, then he must exist. All right, cosmological cause and effect. For everything that is here, there has to be a cause, and so God must be that cause. Teleological. Um, when you have a great design, uh, there has to be a great designer. So um, that's the teleological argument. Since there is this intricate design, there must be a designer. Okay, anthropological argument. Uh, because man exists in the identity that he does, uh, then the one who created him must have that identity but higher. So that's basically those four arguments in a nutshell. Okay, let's go back to the question page now. Page 44 in chapter 5 of Major Bible Themes. That chapter begins on page 38, I believe, but we are on page 44 answering the questions. So question number five, what is the ontological argument for the existence of God? Okay, so we just answered that, um, that God must exist because man believes he does. All right, so question number six. What is the cosmological argument for the existence of God? And cosmological says cause and effect. The things that happen in the universe have a cause, or, or there is, have any, there's an effect in the universe, therefore there must be the cause. And so that's that argument. Um, number seven, what is the teleological argument for the existence of God? Okay, every design must have a designer. I'm giving you the very basics there. Every design must have a designer. Uh, when we study the intricacies of creation and nature, for example, the laws of nature, um, those things, those, that science we can get in a lab and prove, um, we, can, we can understand scientifically, even mathematically, that that is so but now what keeps it there what holds it there what maintains it and so that is the teleological argument uh, now question number eight what is the anthropological argument for the existence of God all right that has to do with a man's nature so God must have a similar but greater nature Capacity to think, capacity to feel, capacity to make moral choices. And so therefore, uh, this is that argument, anthropo, that has to do with man. Anthropo uh, has to do with man. All right. Now, I would like to give a few verses on this because <laughs> um, there is the biblical answer to each one of those. Now, one of the very uh, central passages on that, and you might want to write these in, is in the book of Romans. It, that's in your booklet book there on page 39, first, very first paragraph, indentation. Although these arguments for the existence of God have consider, considerable validity. Uh, look in the book of Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Romans 1, 18. And I'm going to start, I'm sorry, I'm going to start in verse 19. And this also would land on uh, the last argument, anthropological argument as well, just to get a little exercise on this. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Who's the in them? 
Well, that's man. That's mankind. For God hath shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world. Now, that would be cosmological argument. The things we see in the world, cause effect. Um, something has to cause what we see. Um, being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Okay, so the Bible answers these arguments. That's, that's what I want us to understand while we're studying this. Now, just to get a few other passages, we, we'd like to put down Romans 1, 19 through 20, and that would answer cosmological and anthropological. Okay? Now, Let's look in the book of Colossians, chapter 1. Supreme being, one who is over all things. Um, that, would answer, uh, that would answer teleological argument. Teleological argument. And look in Colossians, chapter 1. I'll start in verse 15. Colossians 1, 15. So we might want to come down here where it says teleological argument, and put that in down at the bottom of the page. Uh, Colossians 1, 15 through, um, for our intents and purposes, 17. Okay? And this is teaching the preeminence of Christ, that he is over all things. He has the superior position over all things. Verse 15, who is the image, direct representation, complete manifestation of the invisible God, the firstborn, superior position over all creation, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So he's the reason for all things. He is the teleological argument. He is the designer, you see. And, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So he maintains all these created things. He's the maintainer. Okay? So I want you to see that the Bible answers these arguments. Now, look in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. All right. Now, let's take a look at that. Um, that answers uh, teleological and that answers cosmological. And on, on um, uh, ontological argument. <laughs> All three of them, okay? And notice in the book of Hebrews 1, 2, and 3 for our purposes today. Hath in these last days spoken unto us in Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, cosmological argument, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. All right, that is the teleological argument and upholding all things by the word of his power so again those arguments are answered in scripture so we would want to put Hebrews 1 3 and 4 oops no 2 through 3 down here also on page 38 put that down at the bottom Okay, now we go to Genesis chapter 1 where God says, let us make man in our own image and that answers anthropological argument. Anthropological argument. So look in the book of Genesis chapter 1 and in verse 26. 
Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, let us. Now that's one of those third person plurals that shows us um, that, there, that God is multiple persons, three persons. Third person plural, let us make man in our own image, okay? Um, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So that leaves very little loophole there, by the way. So verse 26 through 27 answers anthropological. So you'll want to write that down so when you're teaching it, you just don't bring out these arguments and leave them sitting there like they can stand by themselves. No, there's, there's Bible reference for each one of those arguments and they are uh, supported through the scriptures. Okay? Are you with me so far? Yes. Okay, okay. All right, I hope I'm not boring you to death. So let's go back <laughs> to verse 44. <laughs> verse 44, we look now, um, we have just answered, I'm sorry, number nine, I apologize. We are on question nine uh, on page 44. Now, you'll want to draw a little arrow from from verse, from verse, from question four through eight, and you will want to put page 38 to 39. Page 38, 39, and what paragraphs? Bottom paragraph, top paragraph. So you know exactly where that's answered, okay? Now question nine on page 44 for chapter five. It says... To what extent does the Old and New Testament emphasize the unity of God? Now, understand a question like that because it's all over the Bible. Practically on every page, really, if you get technical about it. Um, but what we're looking at here is direct passages dealing with it. Okay, so I don't want to get, get the idea that, oh, it's only in those passages. Well, no. <laughs> No, but these are the passages that would be most direct about it. So I want to make that clear first on that question. Uh, it isn't these are the onlys. All right, so in question nine, we would want to turn to page 39 under, um, under our outline B, the unity of the divine trinity. The unity of the divine trinity and with all these devices I don't have a clock okay uh, ver number nine under B in general the Old Testament emphasizes the unity of God and we have three passages there a fact which is also taught in the New Testament okay we want to stop right there for a minute Okay, and let's go to the book of uh, Exodus, chapter 20, verse 3. The book of Exodus, these bear important enough for us to take a minute and look at each one of them. Exodus, chapter 20, and in verse 3, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Exodus, chapter 20, verse 3. Okay, let's look in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 6, verse 4. This one I like a little better. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. 
And that's part of our definition, isn't it, concerning the Trinity? Right? We have three distinct individual persons that are deity completely and perfectly unified as one God and perform differing roles in the unity of the will of God. Okay? So you see in 6, 4, and 5, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Okay. Now let's look in Isaiah 44. The book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 44. All right, and it says in Isaiah 44, verse 6, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Okay, um, that's, that's fine. I think I would like to have a little different one, though. Let me see if I can't find that real quick. Oh, oh it's in the other book. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Look in Isaiah. Write this one down in your, in your notes there and carry it over to your booklet. This is a really important one, and I want you to have it. Isaiah 48. Okay, and let's look at, okay, verse 16 through 17. Okay, Isaiah 48, 16 through 17. All right. Remember that Isaiah is a prophet. He's trying to call Israel graciously back to repentance. He says, come near unto me. Hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was. Now, this is a good passage concerning also the attribute of uh, eternality, infiniteness. The beginning he's talking about is infinite beginning. I and now the Lord God and his spirit hath sent me. Okay? So we have and now the Lord God, that is Jehovah Elohim. And remember that Elohim is a plural name in the Hebrew. And his spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, hath sent me. That's three different people. Okay? Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord thy God, who teacheth thee to profit, who leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldst go. So you see here, we have three persons named. We have three persons named. Um, I'm going to leave that right there. I think that's a very good and convincing verse. Um, when we see Holy One, we can look in the book of um, both Old and New Testament. Psalm 61, Thou shalt not leave thy Holy One to see corruption. And that is preached by Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. All right, so we also have um, this quoted and as in triune Godhead. Okay, a fact that is also taught in the New Testament. Um, oh boy, there's better passages than this. Uh, but let's look in John chapter 10. Verse 30. Uh, that's, a, that's an all-time uh, obvious one. We'd be remiss if we didn't, we didn't bring that one out. Um, I and my Father are one. I and my Father are one. And you can go to John 17 and see that connection even more clearly. Uh, John 14, verse 9. I want to take a look at that. 
All right, John 14, 9. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. But while we're in John 14, add verse 16. I think verse 16 here, put a circle around 9, 14, 9. Draw a line up. And, and let's take the reader or the, or the student to verses 15 uh, through 17 of John 14. Was that confusing enough? So John 14, verses 15 through 17. And notice, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I... That's Jesus Christ referring to himself. I will pray who? The Father. And he shall give you another comforter, capital C. And if we follow over to verse 26, but the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. By the way, that's another good passage, verse 26. You can add that one to it. All three persons are named there that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. Okay, so we have uh, three persons named, and we see them performing different roles in relation to the believer. Okay? Yes. All right, now that's, that's uh, very convincing. Uh, of course, we can't, while we're in John 1, we may as well look at this. We taught about this in our last conference, John chapter 1. Oh, there you go. All right, John chapter 1. And let's look, if you will. Uh-oh, I don't have what I want here. Okay, let's go to Luke chapter 3. Luke 3, verse 21 and 22. Luke 3, 21, 22. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was open. Now we see another time like this with, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, where heaven is opened in the book of Acts during the um, stoning of Stephen. And the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily shape, like a dove upon him. The, the dove is not a... We, we, and people are putting doves in their window and stained glasses in churches, and that's the Holy Spirit. No, that's not what it's saying. <laughs> it's, a, it's a simile. A simile is, this is like this. So... Um, this simile is describing the movement of the Holy Spirit's descent. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit was a dove. So please don't read into something that it isn't. A voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, and thee I am well pleased. Now, if we have any doubt about that, we can go to the Mount of Transfiguration, and we'll, we'll know where that voice from heaven and who it's coming from. It's coming from the Father. Okay, so we see all three persons there. And once again, all three are fulfilling different roles. Okay. All right. Uh, John 17, 11, 22, and 23. Those will stand by themselves. And Colossians 1, 15. Well, that links the Father and the Son. Uh, but we can see direct connection. Uh, we see the Trinity there. Okay. Um, now we want to go to question 10. And we'll have to stop with that one. Question number 10. Page 44. Chapter 5 on the Trinity. Major Bible themes. Number 10. To what extent does the whole Old Testament teach the doctrine of the Trinity? That was 10. Now we are on to verse, yes, verse 10. Okay. So uh, look, if you will, under subtopic B. 
the unity of the divine trinity second paragraph second paragraph early in genesis there are references to the spirit of god and the plural personal pronouns are used for god as in genesis 1 26 3 22 and 11 7. now we brought that out a, mi a moment ago um, and those are very significant places by the way we see the holy spirit uh, 11 uh, 7 is the tower of babel let us go down uh, and in verse 322 uh, there is the let us judge man uh, to stay out of the garden so there's the us you can add isaiah 6 to that also who will go for us so that's another place you find that also. Frequently in the Old Testament, there are distinctions within the nature of God in terms of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 7, 14 speaks of the Son as the Emmanuel, God with us, who was to be distinct from Father and Spirit. This Son is called in Isaiah 9, 6, the Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Psalms 2, 7. Uh, God the Father, referred to as I, indicates that it is his purpose to have his Son as the supreme sovereign over the earth. Just as the Father and Son are distinguished, so God is also distinguished from the Holy Spirit in Psalms 104, verse 30, where the Lord God made his Spirit, I'm sorry, sends his Spirit. To these evidences, may be added all the references to the angel of Jehovah. Um, the Lord is our healer. The, the Lord will provide. Um, Jehovah Tisakindu, the Lord um, uh, remaineth, uh, and so forth, which indicate the appearances of God the Son in the Old Testament as one sent by the Father, and references to the Spirit of the Lord as the Holy Spirit distinct from the Father and the Son. Okay, I want to add one passage to that, and I'm going to have to quit here because I'm getting awful close to dealing with the guys in the DRC. So let's look in Isaiah, if you will, please. The book of Isaiah explained there is the mission of Jesus Christ I don't know why this is being I'm having a hard time finding it and notice if you will in Isaiah chapter 63 Isaiah 63 it is uh, a replay of how God led Israel in the days of Moses and if you look in 63 8 for he said, surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their Savior, capital S. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. That is the angel of the Lord. It, it doesn't say an angel. It is the angel. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. And he bore them and carried them all the days of their life. But they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. Um, notice in verse 11 also, where, the last question at the end of that verse, where is he who put his Holy Spirit within him? Who? Moses. Okay who led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them. Whose glorious arm? Well, the Savior, Jesus Christ, made himself an everlasting name. Okay, so you see here God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament working in different roles with Moses and the children of Israel in their time in the wilderness. Okay, I'm going to leave us right there. Uh, I think we're on, I'm going to circle this, we're on number 11.
and we'll get together next time in major Bible themes. And then I'm going to have you start answering some of the questions with your book. Okay? So I can see you've got them. Yes. And it'll kind of be a practice answer teaching, and you'll get used to handling it that way. Okay, let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we praise you today for the triune Godhead. And Father, we see both in the Old and New Testament um, that there is a perfect unity. They are one and yet three persons. And Father, we thank you for the Father, the Jesus Christ, interceding to the Father, sending the Holy Spirit, and that we are in him and he in us. And Father, we thank you for this blessed truth concerning our faith. In Jesus' name, amen.